What a week it has been. Uh, I don't know about you, but it's been uh, pretty uh, overwhelmingly emotional uh, for me as I have talked to so many of you, whether you're watching from Otis, you're watching online about what took place at the capital of our country. And uh, if you've not got a chance you know, to hear some of uh, my raw thoughts I want to make sure that you know that that was put out on social media, you know, this morning in place or with a devotional uh, for about 15 minutes. Uh, but my soul and my heart has been grieving, has been uh, disgusted. Uh, I don't care what aisle of the aisle you're on. I don't care who's responsible, you know, for it. Um, I just know that Jesus' people are not supposed to be about it. And whether it's the capital whether it's what took place in Seattle, what takes place in Portland, uh, violence is not the way that God has called us to get our point across. And I know that uh, many people have asked, but I don't know what to do. Is there's got to be something you know, that we're supposed to be able to do as followers you know, of Jesus Christ. And there are. And uh, a summation of this morning, without going into more detail, is there's three things I want to challenge all of us with. How much first do we believe in the power of prayer? Can we continue to pray that God is Lord, that he is sovereign, that he is in charge, that we can put our trust and our hope, and can we pray for everyone involved? You know, can we pray for the police? Can we pray for the protesters? Can we pray for Trump? Can we pray for Biden? Can we pray for Congress? Can we pray for our nation? Can we pray, are we going to be a people of prayer? The second thing, the Bible is very clear. It has called us to be peacemakers. It says, blessed are the peacemakers. They will inherit the earth. Peacemakers, not peacekeepers. Uh, peacekeepers are those who uh, we often call, make fun of people who live in the South. Sorry if you're from the South. You know, everything's always okay. Oh, you're so sweet. Oh, bless your heart. You know, all, all that other kind of stuff. Love my Southern accent. It's pretty terrible. <laughs> peacemakers, you know, peacekeepers are ones who just, just want to keep the peace at all costs. You know, don't want to deal with anything. Peacemakers, in order, in order to make peace, you have to go after conflict. You have to find people at war, whether it be war with you and someone else or other people at war with each other, and Christ has called us to step into those situations to be peacemakers, to find ways to build bridges in our community which shines light on his name. That's our role. That's what we're called to do. And so if you know someone who has an opposite side opinion or who is struggling and is on the other side, God has called and commanded us to be peacemakers. The third thing that he's asked us to do, especially in a time like this, and as we continue to go on, is to keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, that we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven first and foremost, but we live here in the United States of America second. And as Peter stepped out of the boat with the wind and the waves that were going crazy, the wind and waves did not stop while he was walking on water. They were still going on while he kept his eyes on Jesus. But as soon as he took his eyes off of Jesus, as soon as he started focusing on all the circumstances around him, instantly he fell. And I know my heart grieves for many of us, many of you who are followers of Christ, who are taking your eyes off Jesus and focusing on everything else. And what you're going to find is your anxiety is going to continue to rise. So is your fear. And so is you know, the discouragement of the time and place that we are in. But there is hope, and the hope comes from prayer, the hope comes from being peacemakers, and the hope comes as we continue to keep our eyes on Jesus. My prayer is that that's something that we will do. And I don't know if this was like the tipping point for me emotionally. I'm not usually an emotional you know, kind of person, but I've just really had a hard time. I don't know if as much has been the circumstances as much with how we're reacting to the circumstances. You know, and just trying to say, we've got to be better than this. We've got to be able to model, you know, this and not let a few people in all different parts of the country represent whatever they're trying to represent, especially those who are pretending to represent Jesus, because it's just not the case. And we can talk and we can walk through that, but that is my prayer and that is my heart for us. And God has called me to be a representative for you to try to show biblically what that looks like. And we'll continue the dialogue and conversation, trying to continue to make Jesus Lord and Savior. With that being said, I feel like I just need to pray to get my heart and my mind right as we go into our message on this day. Jesus, thank you. 
Lord, thank you for the opportunity that we do have to come before you. And we pray right now. Lord, we pray for Congress. We pray for incoming President Biden. We pray for outgoing President Trump. We pray for uh, the people who have been protesting. We pray for the discouragement in our nation. We pray for the blame that's already been going around. We pray for the confusion. We pray for the hurt. We pray for the loss. We pray for, Lord, the person who lost their life in the midst of all this. Father, across our country, we, this is just another of this last year. And we just ask you to intercede. Help us to know how we can be peacemakers. Help us to know how we can build bridges. Help us to know how to shine lights for you. Lord, help us, most importantly, to keep our eyes focused on you. To know that the peace that surpasses all understanding comes when we're focused on you. Father, that we would be guided and more focused in your word now and led by your spirit more now than ever. We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I quit. How's that for a transition? Uh, we, we all have uh, made some interesting excuses in our lives for the reasons why things are either happening to us or the reasons why we don't engage in something or the reasons why we give for not doing what maybe we've been asked to be told. And so I actually asked on social media, you know, um, what are some excuses, some of the best excuses that you have heard? And for some reason, uh, teachers uh, gave me a lot of information. Uh, they've, uh, those of you who are teachers, I just want to thank you uh, online for submitting numerous responses uh, and some others as well. Let me start with some of the others and we'll get some of the teachers. Uh, like Suze wrote this, when I invited someone to attend something, that person responded, it's my sister's dog's birthday party that day. That's low. I mean, that is low. It's not even, you can't even make up you know, my sister's dog's birthday party. Uh, Jordan wrote, a student told her as a teacher that they didn't have their writing done because they had to eat dinner, even though we've been hybrid and they're home all day. Right? She's like, not a good excuse. Uh, Cameron wrote, I asked a student why he had missed school the day before. This is in middle school, by the way. He said, I couldn't find my pants. I said, well, in that case, we appreciate you taking the day off. <laughs> it's been middle school. Uh, Miles wrote, when I was seven or eight, my dad asked why I was fighting, and I answered, he hit me back first. <laughs> Some of you guys will process, process that. Uh, David wrote, after being asked why he was doing something, my son paused, then waved his hand and said, these are not the droids you were looking for. Hard to discipline when you're laughing out loud and laughing very hard. Uh, Jill wrote, I had a student give me a note from a parent once saying the student couldn't do his homework because the family simply didn't have a pencil for the child to use. But that note was written in pencil. <laughs> so she's like, uh, wait a minute, you know, here. Uh, Jill also wrote, you know, I had a student once, you know, who was asked to write an apology for hitting a classmate and essentially wrote this, I'm sorry your face hit my hand. <laughs> I was like, that one's awesome. You know, that one, that one's pretty good. But my favorite, not even close, not related to school, by the way, uh, John wrote this, had an employee tell me he couldn't come to work because his grandfather had a heart attack. Turned out he robbed a drugstore and was hiding from the police. Let's just say he didn't get employee of the year after that. Like a real situation. He's like, uh, yeah, that's not really actually what happened. See, as we start this series of the things, there are things in our lives that we need to quit in order for our lives to be better in the way that God has wired and designed our lives to be. And so here's the first thing I want to challenge all of us to quit in 2021. I quit making excuses. Okay? Can we quit making excuses? It's hard because that seems to be our human default mechanism. We're always ready to make an excuse, especially when we've been caught. Right, when we've been caught doing something wrong or we didn't do what was asked or expected of us, our natural inclination is not to own it. Our inclination is to make up an excuse. And this isn't new. It started in the beginning of time. Right? Adam and Eve in the garden, they disobey God. They eat the forbidden fruit. The serpent you know, says to Eve, Eve takes, eats, gives it to Adam. Then all of a sudden their eyes are open and they're like, oh my gosh, what did we do? And then God comes to them and confronts them with what they've done. Now here's their chance. We're sorry, God. We own it. Our bad. We sinned. But that's not what happened. In Genesis 3, 12, it says, the man said, here's what happened, God. 
the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit with the tree and I ate it. So our first tendency in all humankind, and it's our tendency today, is to play the blame game. It's not my fault. It's the woman's fault. And not only is it the woman's fault, but you created the woman. So God, it's really your fault, right? I'm not taking any ownership of this. It is your fault and it's the woman's fault. And men have been blaming women ever since. So then God says, all right, women, you're not off the hook. So then he says to the woman, what is it that you have done? And the woman said, well, it's the serpent who deceived me. And and then I ate it. So what is she saying? Well, Adam's going to blame me, but I'm going to be the victim in this, right? It's not my fault. I'm the victim. I'm the innocent person. I wouldn't have done it if it wasn't for the serpent. Not my fault. I'm the, I'm the victim. Here's what I know. In marital counseling, the, what works best in any marital counseling is I don't care if it's 90% one person's fault and 10% the other. 99% and 1%. The best way for marital counseling to work is to own your part. To quit making excuses and to quit blaming and quit playing the victim because that's what usually happens when we're caught or when in a difficult situation. So here we are to make this commitment, this first one of the year, to quit making excuses. It's a new year. It's a new opportunity to become the people that God created us to be. In fact, in Psalms 139, verse 13, it says, For you, God, created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God created you. No more blaming. No more being the victim. So here are some questions that I want you to process as we're kicking off this this series and this new year. What are things that you want to change or improve in your life? And, and I really hope you'll take time now or you'll take time, you know, this week, you know, online. What are things you want to dream a little bit? What do you want to improve in your life? What do you want to see change in 2021? There's a lot of power that resides in your hands when it comes to this. And a lot of people make these uh, like New Year's resolutions. That's kind of where we get this concept and idea from. Do you know by the end of January, 40% of all New Year's resolutions don't make it? By February 14th, 75% don't make it. So there has to be a reason why. If I want to dream, if I want to make some changes, if I want to grow this year, why is it that I have a hard time not making it? Could it be that many of these dreams or goals are me-centered and not necessarily God-centered? Which leads us to the second question. What does God, who is the creator of all and who loves you more than maybe we'll ever know on this side of eternity, want to be different about your life? Please take time to answer that question. What do you think God, who loves you, not because you're not measuring up, but who loves you, wants to see change or be different in your life? Uh, For example, maybe God's asking you to become more generous this year with your time and your talents and your treasures. Uh, Maybe he wants you to spiritually invest more in your marriage or your children. Maybe he wants you to reach more friends for Jesus Christ. I, I don't know what God has. I can't answer that question for you. You need to go to God and ask him that question and seek his face and say, God, here I am. What do you want to change in me? What do you want to do in my life? Because here's the most important question that follows that. Why? Why does God want this part of your life to be different? You see, that's the power question. That's the motivator. That's the fuel. That's the juice that will keep you going if you can understand the why behind the what God is wanting to do in your life this year. Now, you might say, like, I'll give you an example. You might say, I want to get in shape. There you go. That's one of those New Year's resolutions that don't seem to last very long for a lot of people. I want to eat right and lose weight. Now, the question is, why? Why do you want to do that? Well, because I'm not in shape. I'm kind of fat, and I don't look good in my fat jeans anymore. That could be the answer. Now, it's not a bad answer, but it's not what I'm asking. Why does God want you to get in better shape? That's what you got to ask yourself. And the answer is because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's a house for God. God wants to see life exist in you the way that he created so that you can be all that he has called you to be, not only for your life, but for those around you, which is going to be hindered if you're not in shape in the way that he called and designed you to be. All of a sudden you're like, oh, that why is is greater than my why than just fitting in some jeans. See, when we can connect the spiritual why 
to the what, the spiritual why will motivate us so much more to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish this coming year. Maybe one of your goals is to get out of debt and to get spending under control. Why? Why? Well, because debts are bad and I want to get a boat. Now, 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 that's not bad. Debt is bad and getting a boat is fine. There's nothing wrong with getting a boat. But why does God want you to get out of debt? Could it be that so spiritually you can experience what it means to trust him at a deeper level and to see the resources that he has given to you for such a short time can be used to expand and impact other people's lives both here on earth and for all eternity? Whoa, that's a bigger why. See, it's a spiritual why that can honor God in that way. I mean, you might say to yourself, I think God wants me to read through the Bible in a year. Or God wants me to pray with my wife more. Or he wants me to invest more in my kids. You know, uh, I want to be in a small group. Why? Why? Well, I just think that he does. No, no, no. The why is that you're going to experience the best that he has for you because he's the one that's given you what it is that he wants to change in you. He's going to partner with you so that you can become who he has called you to become. That's good news. And so what stops us from experiencing these things that God wants us to experience? You're going to have to take some time away from Sunday. You're going to have to do some homework and you're going to have to ask the why question of God. First what and then why. Once you're able to write that down, Here's what's going to hinder you and I from accomplishing what God wants to accomplish in your life in 2021. Excuses. Excuses. It's interesting. I can tell you personally for me, I know that God is calling me to spend more time on my spiritual, physical, and relational health. You know, there, are, there are so many reasons that God is asking me to do that so that I can be more and more filled so that I can impact more and more people for God's kingdom in 2021 than I was able to in 2020 if I can focus on some of these things. So what is your why? What is your what? Now, let me give it one for, for all of you that I, I can guarantee you if this isn't already one of your goals, if this has not already happened in your life, this is one of God's goals for you. Okay, if you're watching online, make sure you pay attention. If you're in the room, if you're at Otis, make sure you pay attention. The most important decision that you can make this year that I know God wants for you is to follow Jesus. If you've not yet committed to making Jesus Savior and Lord of your life, that's what God wants from you. 100%, I can go to the grave knowing that that's 100% true, that that's what he would want for your life for this year. Now, when you're open to it, when you begin to consider it, the hard part is your natural nature, we'll even call it our sinful nature, is going to give up some, some great excuses for why I shouldn't be a follower of Christ. And it's as, it's as old as when Jesus told this parable, you know, in the New Testament. In Luke chapter 14, there was a guy who comes to Jesus and he says these words, blessed is the one who will be living forever in eternity with God. What he's saying is, blessed is anyone who gets to spend eternity with God through Jesus Christ. I get to be in heaven. Blessed is that person. So Jesus says these words. A certain man was preparing a great banquet, and he invited many guests. He's talking about the eternal banquet in heaven that we're going to have with him. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servants to tell those who'd been invited, come, for everything is now ready. You're invited. Come be a part of this. You're welcome to be a part of this. But they all alike began to make what? Excuses. Okay, notice the excuses because they're as common for Jesus' day as they are for our day. Here's one of the reasons that people don't come to faith, and this might be one of your reasons. First said, I had just bought a field and I must go and see it. So please excuse me. In other words, my possessions... My comfort, what I think is most important and valuable, is more important than my value in Jesus Christ, and so I choose this. It's an easy temptation. See, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Money in itself is an inanimate object. You know, and it doesn't say all money is evil, but the love, the pursuit, if that's the gain, it's going to distract you from ever wanting to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and the invitation to the eternal banquet in heaven. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Well, what does that mean for us? It's our work. Okay, how often does our work or pursuit of climbing that corporate ladder hinder us from the possibility that there might be a Savior and Lord we need to accept? 
or some of my hobbies, any of those things that are more important than Jesus. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come to the banquet. I can't tell you how often a relationship, even a relationship that God may provide to somebody's life becomes the idol that replaces God. How, how often it is that, you know, I found this relationship or I have a child or all these wonderful gifts of God, and yet those things can become things that prevent us from coming into relationship with God, that we think that it's more important. See, what excuses before you became a follower of Jesus Christ did you make before you actually decided to accept Christ? And if you've not accepted Christ, what current excuse are you making? And have you made that known? Allow us to walk a journey with you to see if there might be some answers to some of the excuses that you may have. Now, if you are of a follower of Christ, or to keep growing, God is going to ask you to do something this year. That I promise you, if you spend time praying with him and asking God, what do you want to do, that it's not going to be easy. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be difficult, and it's going to be hard for you. Okay, It may not be hard for the person sitting next to you. And that's one of the mistakes that we make, right? I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, the, the number one fear, you know, in America is public speaking, right? So I've asked, you know, different staff people, hey, why don't you come up and kind of share? I could never do that. I could never. And what if I looked at that person and be like, what's the problem? It's so easy. They'd be like, you're nuts. Because it may not be as hard for me, but it could be incredibly difficult for you. What is God calling you to do? that may be challenging for you, that's going to be different than the person sitting next to you, the person who's on the couch at home, the person who's in Otis right now. What is God calling you to do? Now, we look in the Old Testament, and if you know anything about the Old Testament, you know there's a guy named Moses. Right? <laughs> Moses is a pretty phenomenal leader. Right? He led the entire nation of Israel out of slavery in Egypt and to the precipice of the promised land. Millions of people was underneath his oversight and leadership as he was underneath the oversight and leadership of the Lord. That's pretty impressive. That's pretty significant. His name is going to be remembered for all time. We still read about him today. But that's not how he started. See, God comes to him. In Exodus chapter 3, a burning bush, you know, it's not burning up, walks in, what's going on? You're on holy, holy ground, take your shoes off. And I'm like, what's going on? He goes, I've heard the cry of my people in, in, in Egypt. And so Moses, I'm sending you. Of all the people in the world, I'm challenging you in minus 2020 BC, whatever time it was. You know, this is the year I'm going to do it. And he's like, no freaking way. I ain't doing that. God is asking, and he says no. Now, he doesn't just say no. He gives them five excuses for why he's not the guy to be able to do what God has called him to do. Verse 11, but Moses protested to God. Here's excuse number one. Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people out of Egypt? Do you know what he's saying? God, I'm not good enough. I don't measure up. See, he was content with where he was. He'd been, you know, a shepherd for now 40 years in Midian. And often, God will call us to do something outside of our comfort zone in order for us to depend on him. But our way of looking at it is like, I can't do that. I don't have the ability. I'm not good enough. Pick somebody else who seems to be more, better qualified for this. And God says, okay, let me just remind you, I, God, will be with you. Okay, so that's your excuse. And so I will be with you. You are not going to be alone. And whatever I'm going to challenge you to do, I'm not asking you to do something that I'm not going to walk along this journey with you in order to do that. That excuse doesn't fly. So Moses is like, oh. So he protested again. If I go to the people of Israel... To tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, well, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? Do you know what he's saying? I don't have all the answers. How often are we paralyzed because we don't have all of the answers laid out? We don't have everything lined up. And for those of us who are control freaks and list makers, and we're like, I can't proceed to B until I accomplish A. God says, no, no, you have to go and you've got to trust me. Trust me, even if you don't have the answers. 
See, God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say that to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. Say this, that I am Yahweh the Lord, the God of your ancestors, of God of, uh, uh, and the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, who has sent me to you. Took away that excuse. So here we are, number three. <laughs> Moses isn't done. But what if they don't believe me or listen to me? What if they say, the Lord never appeared to you? Oh, this is our favorite excuse, isn't it? The what if excuse. What if I fail? What if I blow it? I don't want to, I mean, because nobody likes having expectations up to here and you fail. Do you know the best way to live the life is to have no expectations at all? You know, to have the bar be so low that you never, ever fail. I mean, what if, you know, I step out? What if, I mean, how many times, and we hear this a lot, those of your parents from your kids, what if, but what if, but what if, okay, what if aliens come down right now? What if you get in a car wreck? What if, you know, and so I have known so many people, and I'll, I'll give an example of this, who will not go on an international mission experience. And the reason is the what if. What if I get sick? What if I get kidnapped? What if I die? I said, what if? You get to go be with Jesus. It's okay. I'm like, that's not very fun. It's the what if questions, you know, that we have. What if I can't afford this, what God is asking me to do? You know, what if I have to leave something behind that I really feel like I love? What if? Maybe that's one of the excuses that you might find yourself with as well. And so God comes to him and says, okay. Let me show you a couple miracles, the what if thing, that it's going to prove to them who I am. I'm going to do some pretty crazy things through you. See that staff? It's going to become a snake. We're going to pick it up. Put your hand in your cloak. It's going to become, you know, leprous. Oh my gosh, I'm going to die. No, put it back in. No, I'm actually all well again. I'm going to be with you. Let me just remind you of this once again. Moses wasn't done though. I think I'd be done by that time. Well, I don't know about you. And verse 10 says, oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I've never been and I'm not now, even though you have spoken to me. I get tongue tied and my words get tangled. You know what he's saying? I don't believe I have the ability. See, not only do I believe I'm not good enough, but I don't believe I have the ability because on my own power, and whenever I've tried to talk to people, especially when I get nervous, I get tongue tied. I get twisted. I don't can't do that. God, wait a minute. You're calling me to talk to my neighbor who doesn't know Jesus? I don't know how to talk to people who don't know Jesus. I don't have the ability to do that. I'm going to call Pastor Steve. I'm going to call Pastor Kenny. They'll do it. You know, all the, because they're paid professionals. You know, that's what we'll do. I'll have them do it. And God's like, no, no, no. I, I'm calling you to reach out. I'm calling you to do this in your life. And I know it's going to be uncomfortable, but trust me. And I love his response. God just looks at him and says, um, Moses, who made the tongue? I was like, like, you, God? Yeah, yeah. I, I will be able to speak through you. I will make sure that I will be there. We're going to get through this. Stop giving me an excuse. And then Moses was done with his excuses, except for he had one final bullet in the chamber. But Moses again pleaded, Lord, please just send somebody else. <laughs> I love the honesty. You know, if I don't have anything else, just please send somebody else. And what he's saying is like, God, I know that you're calling me to do this. I know that you're asking me to do this. I just honestly don't want to do it. Let's just be real. I just don't want to do it. And I know you're calling me to do this on a regular basis. And so God gets angry with him, a righteous anger, the Bible says, and says, okay, okay. Since I'm having a hard time working through these excuses, here comes your brother Aaron. You're not going to go alone. And so you're not off the hook I'm not sending Aaron in your place. I'm sending Aaron with you, which is really cool because that's the way Jesus did most of his sending. He did do send people by themselves. He sent them in pairs, which reminds us that when we're ready to come up with excuses, we need somebody else on the journey with us, don't we? What is God calling you to do? Oh, one last thing there. Remember a guy by the name of Jonah? Jonah was called to go to Nineveh to preach the gospel. He said, forget this. I'm going the opposite direction. And he ended up in the belly of a whale. So let me have this be on your mind as you leave. <laughs> Don't end up in a whale. Okay. Don't end up in the belly of a fish. Okay. Just don't do that because God does not want, he loves you so much that he wants you to experience the best in 2021. 
He wants to do some incredible things in your life, yet our hesitancy is to be like Moses. Can you imagine if Moses still refused after that? Look what his life became when he was willing to stand and speak, when he was willing to do what God had asked him to do, and he ran out of the excuses. So my question as we close today, what is God asking from you? In 2021, and you're going to need to take some time in prayer, in search of God's word, maybe in talking to some other people, that is your next step to discover what is the one thing, just one. Yeah, sometimes we have these lists of 100 things and we get so polar, uh, paralyzed by the list that we never accomplish any of them. Just pick one. And I don't care if you're 14, if you're 105. If you're 105, by the way, I want to meet you. That's pretty awesome. You know, but it doesn't matter the age span. What is God wanting for you? What is he wanting from you? And can you commit to saying no more excuses? Are you going to fail? Yeah. Are you going to make mistakes? Yeah. But if God is calling you to it, in the end, he will carry it on to completion. God always works for the good. He always wants to finish the work that has been started. And he wants to allow you to be part of the process. Your part is to submit to God and say, yep, that's going to be my thing this year. That's what you're asking me to do. I will be willing to do that. God will do his part as well. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity that we have, Lord, just to say in our own hearts and minds, no more excuses. I quit. I quit making excuses. Lord, allow us to spend time to, in this day or maybe this week uh, in, in your word and just ask the question, God, what do you want me to become this year? What do you want me to do this year? And why? Why do you want me to do that? And then allow me, Father, when I and we have those times where we want to make those excuses that we would have people in our lives to remind us that you are faithful, that you are there, that you're the one that called us and that you're going to do amazing things if we would step out of our comfort zone and to do what you ask. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.